afternoon, and thank you for joining us today at City Club's June 3rd Friday Forum. I'm Sharon Van Sickle Robbins, president of City Club, and I would like to welcome you all, those of you here with us today at the Governor Hotel, and those of you listening on OPB or KBPS radio, or watching on Portland Community Media's CityNet 30. Today, we're very pleased to welcome Senator Jeff Merkley in his first appearance at City Club since his election. But first, a few announcements. To begin with, if you haven't already silenced your cell phones, please do that now. Next, I'd like to recognize one of our new City Club members, Tom Kar Karwaki. And um, if you could please stand, we'd like to give you a City Club welcome. City Club's corporate and media partners also do a tremendous part in supporting club activities, and I'd like to thank our media partners, including Oregon Business Magazine. I'd also like to offer our appreciation to the Friday Forum corporate sponsors. Please join me in offering our sincere appreciation to our spring quarter sponsors, communications firm Morell Inc., Utility company Northwest Natural, who are here with us today, including Margaret Kirkpatrick, Vice President and Chief Counsel, and the law firms of Perkins Coie and Schwabi Williamson Wyatt. We are truly grateful for your support. Thank you. If your company or firm would like to be a City Club sponsor, please contact City Club staff at the back of the room or call the City Club office. I'd also like to welcome the members of our leadership circle who are here as our guests today. If they would all stand, we all have our little tags on. Every annual fund contribution matters, but our leadership circle donors contribute over $50,000 each year to support the club's work, and we couldn't do it without them. So thank you very much. Once again, we'll be taking index card questions today um, during the question and answer period. So during the forum, we invite you to write any questions that you have for our speaker on the index cards that are at every table. You don't have to be a City Club member to submit one of these questions. And then during the board host question, City Club staff will collect the cards and select a provocative question, which I'll read from the microphone. City Club members are still welcome to come to the microphone to ask their questions during the Q&A, and we're sure you'll come up with some great questions for today's speaker. And now to today's program. The United States possesses only 2% of the world's oil reserves, yet our nation uses a full one quarter of all the oil produced globally. Reliance on oil-producing nations such as Saudi Arabia, Russia, Iraq, Venezuela, and Nigeria not only costs our nation billions, but also aids governments that often act against our national security interests. Moreover, it prevents the U.S. from investing more fully in homegrown clean energy, while undermining efforts to improve our air and water quality. Locally, skyrocketing gas prices are damaging potential economic recovery and hurting Oregon families. Today, U.S. Senator Jeff Merkley will describe his plan to elimin eliminate all foreign oil imports from non-North American nations in 20 years. Senator Merkley began his public service as a 19-year-old college intern with Oregon's former Senator Mark Hatfield. He studied international relations at Stanford and worked in India and Mexico, including on a project to build and operate an environmental camp for Mexican children. After earning a graduate degree in public policy at Princeton's Woodrow Wilson School of Public and International Affairs, he worked as a national security analyst at the Pentagon and at the Congressional Budget Office. In 1991, he returned to Oregon to lead Portland's Habitat for Humanity and later became director of housing development at Human Solutions. Senator Merkley won his first campaign for state representative in 1998. He was elected Democratic leader in 2003 and became Speaker of the Oregon House in 2007. He won election to the U.S. Senate in 2008. Without further ado, please help me welcome Senator Jeff Merkley.
Thank you very much, uh, Sharon. It's great to be back here with the City Club to talk about energy and energy independence. My first serious encounter with energy came when I bought my first car, a 1962 Falcon purchased in 1976 from my parents. And uh, I had the traditional American love affair with a car. I was up and down the, the West Coast um, innumerable times, back and forth uh, across the country many times. And the cool thing about this Falcon was I could repair everything myself. That is, until the day that the uh, transmission went out in Des Moines, Iowa, and I salvaged one from a junkyard to put in a, a replacement. And after I got it all put in, was very excited to be done with it. Uh, it was all locked up. And I actually had to take that, that Falcon to a mechanic. And I think that was the only time in its entire life that that happened. But I'll tell you this, the other thing I loved about that car is it was very cheap to travel places. Back then, the cost of a gallon of gasoline was 60 cents. You could go a long ways on very little. But times change. This month, you and I are paying $4 per gallon at the gas pump. It's a dollar more than a year ago. It's more than six times what it was in 1976. We in America have an energy problem. The high price of gas threatens to choke off our budding recovery just as Oregonians are starting to find jobs. Natalie Rigman White of Eugene helps to run an organic food business. She told me the gas spike was hurting her business and driving food prices higher at a time that folks were hurting. Two days ago, I talked to Deschutes Brewery, which told me that energy expenses were a major factor in their bottom line and that they are immersed in trying to find a host of ways to drive efficiencies to decrease those costs. Amy's Kitchen, that I talked to yesterday, said they have a very, very small window of margin and that that margin is being consumed now by the cost of fuel. In fact, they're planning to build a new Amy's Kitchen plant on the East Coast because the cost of trucking their product across the country is now becoming untenable. So small businesses are being hurt, and so are families. Families are paying 50 to $60 to fill up their car, and that's money out of the rent, money out of the, out of the groceries, money out of the, the mortgage. And then families are paying again through higher prices. And there is a lot more to this challenge. High oil prices, do not create a domestic wealth transfer. In large, in large part, they drive an international transfer to oil companies and foreign governments. And we are spending more than a billion dollars a day on imported oil. In fact, imported oil now accounts for over half of our trade deficit. In addition to this economic factor in terms of our dependence on foreign oil, we have a national security challenge. We have to build and deploy military forces and forge diplomatic strategies to sustain access to oil, sometimes at odds with very important other objectives of our nation. And of those dollars we send overseas, some end up in the hands of our terrorist enemies. It was Clinton CIA Director James Woolsey that commented that this is the first time since the Civil War that we have funded both sides of a conflict. And that's not a great strategy. And whether we pay 60 cents per gallon or $4 per gallon, the gasoline we're putting into our car is a serious threat to our planet. Before the Industrial Revolution, the amount of carbon dioxide in the air was about 270 parts per million, sometimes 280 parts per million. The time I was born, 1956, this had surged from that 270, 280 to 316, driven by the coal that we were burning during the Industrial Revolution. By the time I graduated from college, it went from 316 to 340. Now, I'd like to tell you that from that point forward, our generation took over the reins of policy, worked with leaders around the world, and uh, took on carbon pollution in a serious way and that all of us have nothing more to worry about. I'd like to say that. I, unfortunately, I can't say that. When I ran for the legislature in 1998, the level went from 340 to 368. 
And then, as I stand before you today, we're only a few points away from 400. Well, okay, a lot of numbers from 270 to 400. Scientists note that the planet has not seen this concentration in a very long time. A study by William Happer, a Princeton professor that was published, the results were published in the Science Magazine, concluded that the planet has not seen a concentration over 380 for 360,000 years and probably not in the last 20 million years. Now in 2009, one of my uh, uh, hearings before the Environment Committee, we had someone testifying and saying, don't worry about carbon pollution and don't worry about global warming because the planet's had a lot of higher concentrations of carbon before. And then uh, Senator Boxer asked, well, when was he talking about? Uh, well, he was talking about 80 million years ago. Well, I think most of us can recognize that humans weren't on the planet 80 million years ago. And thus, his testimony was not uh, soothing. <laughs> At a minimum, it wasn't soothing. I think of it this way, scientists uh, lay out that we should be concerned if our, our level is over 350. Just like if you're having a beer and driving, you know that there is a standard that if your blood alcohol level is over 0.08, you should be worried, and driving is a problem. And here on the planet, the equivalent is if we're over 350 parts per million carbon dioxide, we have a problem and you should be concerned. And it has been 25 years that we've been over that amount, and the rate is increasing. My first two decades on this planet, the rate went up one part per million each year. The last decade, it has gone up two parts per million. So as opposed to leveling out and reversing, currently the curve is climbing ever more steeply. And the results are everywhere. Melting glaciers, melting ice caps, forests of so-called drunken trees that stagger about in the thawing permafrost. Higher ocean acidity, because the ocean absorbs a lot of carbon dioxide. Dying coral reefs. Much more powerful storms driven by warmer atmospheric temperatures and, interestingly, more damaging droughts as patterns change. So what are we going to do about our dysfunctional energy policy and the resulting economic damage, the national security risk, and the climbing carbon pollution? We must ask ourselves, are we prepared to make a serious change? I'm going to ask all of you here today to indicate by raising your hands whether it's largely an acceptable option to sustain our current energy policy of subsidizing oil and coal and experiencing, therefore, rising imports and consumption of fossil fuels. A little bit of feedback. Anyone who likes that strategy? Okay, uh, that's, that's helpful. How many of you here today, here's maybe a tougher question, would support substantial or even an aggressive strategy to reduce the burning of fossil fuels and our dependence on foreign oil? Okay, for our radio audience, that, that vote wasn't close. The city club members have declared overwhelmingly that they are ready for substantial or even aggressive change. And that's important because the test that lies before us is not principally an issue of technology. It is a test, primarily, of political will. And to take the energy challenge seriously, we need to address all dimensions of the challenge, the economic, the national security, and the environmental. And we have to reject false visions of easy solutions. For example, there are those who say we can simply drill more to produce more domestic energy. And this will help with the economic dimension and the national security dimension. Well, they are partially right. In the short term, more drilling will produce more jobs. And there is a reasonable argument for converting the 23 million acres of oil leases in the Gulf that are locked up by the largest oil companies and unused into use it or lose it leases. But such strategies won't produce more oil overnight, as a field can take up to a decade to develop. And the strategy obviously accelerates the depletion of American reserves and makes America more dependent on foreign oil in the long term. Keep in mind, America has only 3% of the world's reserves. 
but we consume fully a quarter of the annual world production of petroleum. And finally, that strategy will not noticeably change the price at the pump. Even under the most expansive possibility estimates are that it would have no more than a three cent a gallon impact because it is a world market and the price is set on a world market and the amount of additional surge in production can't have a large impact. And then there's another vision floating around about the Bakken field in North Dakota and Montana. Some of you have probably received this, this email. I know a lot of the folks who show up in my town halls have received this email. And it has this story on the internet uh, and it says the Bakken field is a massive oil field of sweet crude lying in a shallow pool twice the size of Saudi Arabia's reserves put together but access is being blocked by the EPA. Now this field in Montana and North Dakota uh, gets a lot of attention. Well, what is the real story? The Bakken formation is deep, the oil is locked in shale, the exploitable size is estimated by the USGS Geological Service to be 1 to 2 percent of the Saudi reserves and it's largely untapped not because the EPA is blocking it, but because companies don't believe that they can economically uh, exploit it. And of course, neither the Gulf oil nor the Bakken shale will do a thing to address carbon pollution. So with our feet firmly on the ground, let's come together on an energy strategy that does address the three components of economy and national security and environment, and that can bring together our political dimensions from the right and the left across the aisle. And specifically, such a strategy is to work together to end our addiction on imported oil. Brazil did this. We can do this. First element is to dramatically reduce the oil we consume in cars. We burn a third of our oil in cars. And through greater high mileage cars of traditional design, hybrids, plug-in hybrids, fully electric drive cars, we can make a dramatic difference. By converting half of our cars to electric drive over two decades, we can reduce oil consumption by over three million barrels per day. And for perspective, that equals more than a third of our anticipated imports 20 years from now. To jumpstart this conversation, or this conversion to electric vehicles, I've introduced a bill in partnership with Lamar Alexander, Republican from Tennessee, a member of the Republican leadership, and it's called the Promoting Electric Vehicles Act. Senator Alexander notes that in Tennessee there's a lot of base load electricity unused at night that could be used to fuel up the batteries of electric cars in place of imported oil. Here in Oregon, we have high wind, high flow surpluses, been in the news recently, and the batteries of electric cars could help to capture some of that. There are three major elements in the Promoting Electric Vehicles Act. The first is deployment communities. Half a dozen communities would receive substantial grants to help solve the chicken and the egg problem. That is, that people don't like to put out charging stations when there aren't a lot of people with cars to be charged, and people are reluctant to buy cars when there aren't enough charging stations. The concept is that by having very diverse communities compete for those grants, they'll produce a lot of different strategies in a lot of different settings. And what we learn from that, we can apply on a national scale. The second is battery research and promotion with the goal of greater energy density and more energy per weight. This is looking towards the issue of range anxiety and the goal of a 500 mile battery. This will help drive improvements on the lithium-ion technology that we hear so much about. But also support new technologies, such as that Revolt is working on right here in Portland, the Zinc Air technology. A third major element of the act is to encourage uh, fleet purchases, both from the government and from private companies, to accelerate demand. This bill will cost us $3 billion over five years. That's a lot of money. But three billion over five years, that's $600 million per year. Compare that to the $4 billion a year we currently put out in subsidies to gas and oil industry for, to 
address circumstances that no longer exist, a circumstance having been very low price of oil under $20 a barrel. Or compare that $3 billion investment over the five years to the $2 trillion that we will spend on imported oil over that same time period. Isn't it worth the $3 billion investment to take on an issue that's costing us $2 trillion? Here's something to think about. The last time that we were on the verge of an electric car revolution, it was because California adopted a standard that said if you sold, sell cars in California, you also have to sell a certain portion of electric cars. And every company was developing an electric car. The one that we remember best is the EV1, because it was the star, if you will, if the star can die at the end of a show. Uh, it was the star of, of the uh, uh, who killed the electric car. So you might recall uh, GM recalled those cars and took them out to the desert and crushed them while people were holding prayer vigils over their beloved vehicles. Well, now we're on the verge of another major opportunity, and this time we can't blow it. The Tesla Roadster, the Chevy Volt, the Nissan Leaf have hit the market, really just the front end of the market. And more than a half dozen other cars, including Oregon's own Arkimoto Pulse, are on the way. This time, we cannot let this technological revolution falter. By the way, I had a chance to drive the Arkimoto Pulse prototype yesterday. It's a very neat machine, as, as my son would say, that machine is really bad. <laughs> Meaning for those of you without teenagers that it's uh, really awesome. In addition to electric cars, we have to pursue every other strategy to shift our car use patterns into other modes of transportation, including rail and bus and bike. And of course, here in Portland, we are at the forefront of all of those strategies. A second major element in ending our addiction to imported oil is to increase the efficiency of freight transportation. Here in the Pacific Northwest, we have Cascade Sierra, a nonprofit that works every day with the trucking industry to increase their fuel efficiency, using things like better airfoils, automatic tire inflation, strap-on generators to replace the idling of large diesel engines. And in today's paper, it notes that just yesterday, the Oregon legislature sent the governor a bill that limits uh, truck idling to any more than a few minutes in a, in a given hour. Another potential strategy is to replace diesel engines with natural gas engines for trucks on set delivery routes with natural gas infrastructure. But a major caveat to this is that natural gas produced by hydraulic fracking may turn out to have a bigger global warming footprint because of its associated methane releases than diesel. And that's something that has just a new report has come out and it's an issue that's going to bear a lot of attention. A third approach is to shift more freight from trucks onto barges and onto rail and keep in mind that a train can move a ton of freight almost 500 miles, a ton of freight almost 500 miles on a single gallon of fuel. A third major element in a plan to end our dependence on foreign oil is to develop clean, renewable power. Oregon is on the way to being a world leader in this. We have so much potential, solar energy. We have sun when we have solar tech manufacturing. Solar World, the largest PV producer in the U.S., is nearby. Solo Power is now planning to do, produce a thin film plant right here in Portland. We have PV Powered in Bend, a major producer of inverters for distributed uh, solar. Let's turn to wind. Uh, Caithness is in, in the process of building the largest wind farm, not in America, and not in North, North America, but in the world, here in Oregon, the Shepherd's Flat project. It will have a listed capacity, installed capacity of 845 megawatts. It's a lot of power. The actual annual production is less because the wind doesn't blow at the optimum speed every moment, but it's still a lot of power. And we are home to the North American headquarters of Vestas and Iberdrola. Wave energy. We have some of the best potential wave energy on the entire planet. 
And right now, Oregon Ironworks is completing work on a prototype for ocean-powered technologies that later this year will be floated on a barge down the Columbia River and installed off Reedport. And it is exciting that we can hope that this prototype will create a new path for wave energy contributing to the clean renewable portfolio. And if you talk to folks on the coast, they'll remind you that it's very important this to be done in close conversation with the other industries that utilize the ocean so that we don't end up in a point in damaging our shellfish industry or our ground fish industry or our crabbing and so forth. Biomass. As a commissioner from Douglas County has said, Douglas County could be the Middle East of biomass energy. And this is a new source of potential jobs and timber revenue. It could help pay for thinning, which could produce not only more jobs, but healthier ecosystems for some forests and better timber stands in others. Collins and Lakeview and Roseburg Lumber Products are both building new biomass cogeneration plants. Sisters has deployed a new biomass boiler at a school, and John Day has deployed new boilers at a hospital and an airport. Lisa Jackson, when I first talked to her, was wrestling with the distinction between coal and biomass, noting that they both burn, they both produce carbon dioxide. But if you look at the life cycle, it's entirely different. In fact, a woman at a, a gathering said to me, wouldn't it be great if we had an invention that pulls carbon dioxide out of the air? And I said, well, you'll be very relieved to know that we grow millions of those in the Pacific Northwest. <laughs> and let's not forget about the possibility of advanced biofuels. ZCAM in Boardman is hoping to begin production later this year on a process that takes poplar trees and turns it into ethanol. And then we have geothermal. OIT, Oregon Institute of Technology, is, has laid out the goal of being the first net zero energy campus in the world. There's a lot of potential in and around the Newberry Caldera. And indeed, Lakeview has expanded its use of geothermal energy. And by the way, some of you will be happy to learn that the Lakeview geyser, known as Old Perpetual, which went away for a few years, is back. The fourth element to such a strategy, to bring folks together from the left and right, to take on these important energy challenges, is to have a process for staying the course. We cannot, be a, we cannot afford to be knocked off the path by the back and forth of political elections every two years, or the change of presidencies every four years. Nor can we allow short-term ups and downs in the price of oil to change our course. It's easy to have this conversation when there's a new high of gasoline at the pump, but then it comes down a little bit, and we say, well, let's tend to other problems. Saudi Prince bin Talal said, quote, we want the price of a barrel of oil to be between $70 and $80, not only to help the West, but also to help ourselves. We don't want the West to go and find alternatives because clearly the higher price of oil goes, the more you have an incentive to go find alternatives. In other words, Saudi Arabia wants to play America like a fisherman plays a fish, letting out the line if we pull too hard and then reeling us back in. To keep us on track, Olympia Snow and I are proposing a National Energy Security Council. This council would be charged with the mission of ending America's oil dependence by decreasing our consumption by at least 8 million barrels per day over the next two decades. This has been laid out as a plan that doesn't require over-the-horizon technology. And certainly, with enough national will, we could move more quickly. This council will be made up of top national experts on energy, the economy, the environment, as well as the secretaries of energy, transportation, commerce, and defense, and the administrator of the EPA. These two elements, the mission of ending our dependence on overseas oil and the structure to keep us targeted with on a bipartisan strategy that is a much smarter energy policy, are the two elements of the bill, the National Energy Security Act that I introduced with Senator Olympia Snow from Maine a couple of months ago. 
as we ponder the importance of going forward, let's recognize that the challenge we face is only getting larger. Asia demand for oil, and China demand in particular, is growing fast. I saw this firsthand on a trip to China a month ago. I was struck by how much infrastructure had been constructed in the 14 years before my first trip to China. And it was uh, somewhat um, uh, disturbing to ride on a bullet train from Beijing to Tianjin at over 200 miles per hour. But if you wanted to understand the increase in oil consumption in China, you really had to just simply hear the statistic that every single day, 2,000 more cars are added to the metropolitan transportation grid around Beijing. It is possible and indeed probable that if we stay the current course, a decade from now, $4 per gallon gas will sound like a bargain and we'll be spending far more than a billion dollars a day on imported oil. So we must recognize that our current course is unsustainable, and we must change our energy policy. Now, I look fondly back upon my Ford Falcon and gas at 60 cents a gallon, but that world is not returning. And so we have to look to the future, and we have to face these energy issues head on. We have a choice between a weak, oil-addicted America or a strong, oil-independent America. We have a choice between sending a billion dollars a day overseas or spending those energy dollars on red, white, and blue American-made renewable energy that creates jobs here in our communities. We have a choice between subsidizing carbon-polluting fossil fuels or investing in renewable carbon-free technologies. Let us choose together the path that creates a stronger America, a more robust economy, a more sustainable environment, and let's end our addiction to imported oil. Thank you. Before I introduce our Friday Forum host, if you've written a question on one of those index cards, you can hold them up now so that City Club staff can collect them. Thank you. The first question for our speaker, as always, will be from our Friday Forum host. City Club Governor and Treasurer Ted Kay is our host today. Ted has been a City Club member since 1990, and he received the club's President's Award in 2008 and 2009. Ted. Thank you, Sharon. Senator Merkley, former Senator Bob Packwood spoke from this podium last September describing partisanship in politics and how it has changed for the worse since his days in the Senate. He recalled securing support from all four corners of the square, liberal Democrats, conservative Democrats, conservative Republicans, and liberal Republicans. Times have changed. How do you see getting things accomplished in Washington in today's more partisan environment? Do I get another hour to talk about this? <laughs> uh, so I have uh, a perspective uh, that I think echoes the is issues that uh, Senator Packwood was, was raising. When I was first in D.C. as an intern in 1976 to Senator Hatfield, I was assigned to work on the Tax Reform Act of that year. And, of course, you didn't have a camera on the floor at that point in time, and you didn't have email, so I was sent to cover the debate on the floor, and then I would meet Senator Hatfield as he came out of the elevator, and I'd talk about the, uh, the amendment was up, I'd talk about the mail we'd received, any other aspects of the policy, and then he'd go in and, and vote. But what really struck me is every hour and a half or so, there was a vote on a relevant amendment. That contrasts with what we just went through in the Senate, where we had over six weeks of debate on the Small Business Innovation and Research Bill, not a controversial bill, and we couldn't get agreement to have a single relevant or germane amendment debated in that entire six-week period, and then the whole bill was killed 
because a supermajority was required to end debate and one particular senator wanted to send a message to the Tea Party back home that would be helpful in next year's primary uh, by introducing and, uh, and uh, refusing to go forward without, uh, if you will, uh, a um, non-germane amendment on regulation. This would never have happened in the 1970s. It wouldn't have happened in the 1980s. There were huge controversial debates that were decided on a 51 vote basis. Uh, Clarence Thomas was confirmed to the Supreme Court on a 51 vote basis. But what has changed? Well, one is that senators uh, in the 1970s served in the World War II together. They were in the foxhole together. They could disagree without demonizing. Second, you had three networks that were bringing the conversation together. And now we have a thousand points of uh, not always light, should I say, <laughs> but a thousand points of media information. And they're seeking out the most controversial aspects. And furthermore, there isn't the same interaction of senators in the chamber because they come in from Monday night through, through uh, Thursday night. Uh, they are segregated during that process. Uh, and so all of that, and they don't, they're, they're, I guess I'm saying that the relationships aren't formed. Now, I'm fighting that at a personal level. And by that, I mean when I first went to DC, I arranged meetings uh, with the senators uh, from across the aisle to get to know them. And it's, many of those are the ones I'm working with now. Lamar Alexander, our conversation started when I went to his office in a get to know you. In this last session, I've invited all the new Republican senators to come and I could host them for a conversation. Uh, and having, not all of them have been able to come yet, but a lot have. And, and uh, so building those personal ties. So this is to say that it is a big challenge and we must, because the rules of the road have changed, we must replace the silent objection, that is the silent filibuster, with the talking filibuster, with the Jimmy Stewart filibuster, says you cannot obstruct the Senate unless you're willing to stay and hold the floor and tell America what you believe. We're now going to take questions from the floor, and as always, members are invited to this microphone over here to ask their question, and I'm going to start by reading one of the audience member questions that we received. Asking questions at Friday Forums is a privilege of City Club membership. Before asking your question, please identify yourself as a club member and ask your sec question in 30 seconds or less. And if you don't, I'll flash my question mark card and that means that we want you to ask the question. Okay, so the first question from an audience member is, what is your view of nuclear electric generation and your prognosis for its future? Thank you. Uh, the, uh, I have uh, always thought that you need to think in terms of nuclear power, the risks that it poses uh, in human error terms, in natural disaster uh, terms, uh, certainly in terms of potential terrorist strike. And by the time you address all of those elements, the nuclear plants that we have designed, and they've been relatively the same design over the last 40 years, are more expensive than other forms of renewable energy, and therefore illogical. Now there are new designs that are being talked about. We have a group at Oregon State University that has a design, they're called New Scale, that came out of their study of traditional plants, and it's radically different. I won't explain it, but it's in a, a, a silo and it addresses many of the terrorist threat, uh, human error uh, issues, uh, uh, natural disaster issues. And I don't think we should close our eyes and not look at such designs because we have to wrestle with the possibility of every tool that could be deployed in this battle against global warming. But let me tell you this, until there's something that is more cost effective and the risk absolutely minimized, then we need to take all those tools that we have that are cost effective now. And as I talked about in the speech, there are a host of strategies in hand. And so let's work to utilize those strategies to the maximum extent possible. Ray Polani, an old City Club member. You justly reminded us that the future is not sustainable as presently done. In transportation, we need alternatives to the automobile and trucks. 
rail and mass transit can do that successfully. The question is, will Congress provide the funds to do that for rail and transit to become uh, better than they are and more competitive and so that we can choose them? Will Congress provide the money? Well, I hope so. We have a Secretary of Transportation that has been incredibly supportive, Secretary LaHood. He has come out here to Oregon. Uh, he goes around the nation talking about our, our, our streetcar system, about our light rail system. Uh, one of the, in fact, the first hearing, his confirmation hearing, I asked him if he would re reverse the Bush administration uh, strategy that a special formula to basically block streetcars at being able to have access to, to funding and he said he would and he did and uh, not only did that help for here but it's now helping Oregon to manufacture and sell streetcars to the United States contract in hand in Tucson and a number of other uh, possibilities all contributing to addressing these energy issues the big picture however we should all be concerned about the big picture is that we are investing too little in infrastructure. China, that I just mentioned, is investing 10 to 12 percent of its GDP in infrastructure. Europe is investing 5 percent of its GDP in infrastructure. The United States is investing 2 percent in infrastructure, barely enough to keep repairing the infrastructure that we have right now. We must spend far less on foreign bases and foreign wars, and far more on education and infrastructure. <laughs> Leslie Hill Duell, a City Club member. I've been bothered for years about the long-term and systematic oppression of women in Saudi Arabia and our government's silence on that issue. And I contrast it to South Africa, where eventually we helped black South Africans win their freedom. And I have often thought that there was linkage between our silence about the oppression of women in Saudi Arabia and our energy policy. What, do you think there's a linkage? And could you comment on that? Yes, there is a link. I think it goes to what I was uh, speaking of when I said that our effort to, to address the national security risks of access to oil often work at cross purposes with other important elements of our foreign policy agenda. And uh, it, uh, I think that ending our dependence on foreign oil would, would go a long ways to having a foreign policy based upon a core set of issues rather than uh, a panic over the possibility of losing access to Middle Eastern oil. Sandra Walden, Real Energy Solutions and a um, member of the City Club. Thank you, first of all, uh, Senator Merkley, for your vision and representing us in um, the federal government. Um, as you said, Oregon's a leader in almost every renewable energy uh, field and technology that there is. Uh, unfortunately, uh, we're about to lose that lead as uh, the business energy tax credit and the tax credits for the state are reduced in this next legislative session. The question for you is, um, at the federal level, is there any hope that the investment tax credit and other tax credits that are available in support for renewables uh, can be extended for a longer period of time to give some certainty to um, the development of projects. Thank you. Uh, there is considerable uh, hope in that possibility. There are a number of us working to make that happen. One of the things that's been very frustrating on our, our energy tax credits is they're most effective when they're set for a long time into the future so that companies can count on them being part of the pro forma of their, of their deployment of a renewable source. But if they can't count on them being there every year, it's hard to, to make a large investment based on their, on their presence. So uh, yes, we're going to fight for them, and many of us are fighting to have them set for longer periods of time so they'll get maximum effectiveness out of the dollars that we're, we're spending. 
Steve Novick, City Club member. Senator, first of all, I want to tell you that you're doing such a great job that even my mother, who took my loss to you very hard, now thinks that you're terrific. <laughs> <laughs> My, my, que my question is about the debt limit. So far, the president's argument seems to be we need to raise the debt limit, otherwise we'll scare the financial markets, which is kind of an abstract argument. What about asking the Republicans to propose a budget reflecting the trillion dollars in cuts you'd have to make the next year in order to run the government without raising the debt limit? For that matter, since you guys control the Senate, what about presenting a trillion dollar cuts budget across the board cuts in defense, Medicare, Social Security, et cetera, and forcing a vote on that the way you fo forced a vote in the Senate on the Paul Ryan plan? Uh, th thank you, Steve. And I was hoping you'd show your gratitude by throwing me a softball. <laughs> and Steve, thank you so much for the work you're doing on health care uh, down in Salem. And uh, uh, I must, must say that I think every city club event I've ever come to, uh, Steve has asked perhaps the, the best question of, of the day. So uh, thanks. Um, well, is this one of those points I can uh, turn and, and call out for a family connection? Uh, and, and since my wife is here, maybe she'd like to talk about the debt limit. I want to thank Mary for coming today, Mary Soderberg, my partner. <laughs> The, the conversation over the debt limit is a replay of what happened last December. It's a game of chicken. What happened last December was a plan that increased our national deficit, so the, just the one-year level, by half a trillion dollars. And the same folks who were championing that compromise that increased the debt by half a trillion dollars are now, now saying they don't want to lift the, uh, the debt limit. And that's a very ironic place to be. I must say I opposed uh, that December deal, which kept in place the bonus breaks for the best off in our society that have driven a good share of the increase of our debt over the last 10 years. We must, in fact, have the willpower to eliminate the oil and gas subsidies, to limit the bonus breaks for the best off, to end the war in Afghanistan and bring those dollars back to the United States, and to shut down the $175 billion in programs that the Secretary of Defense says don't contribute to national security. I like your strategy, Steve, of uh, having another vote on the floor to dramatize uh, this issue. What I would like even more is for President Obama to say, this is the lay of the land. We have not shut down any tax loopholes since Senator Packwood was in charge of the Finance Committee and had a major tax reform in 1986. That was 25 years ago. There are, in addition to the oil and gas giveaways, there are a huge number of tax loopholes that have long outlived the purposes for which they were created. So therefore, let's put together a budget that has $1 shutting a tax loophole for every dollar that is, is taken out of a line program, and let's work together to put, bring people together with that format, a dollar of tax expenditures, a dollar limit, and we can reduce the deficit, but do it in a fashion that doesn't balance the, the budget on the back of cutting programs that go directly to the heart of sustaining our working families. Chris Andre, City Club member. I applaud everything that you've said with reservations regarding biomass, but I have one concern which I hope you can address. Uh, the Chinese indeed are surging forward as far as becoming major polluters, if not the major polluter. They have one advantage though, and that is with that sort of totalitarian government, they are able to institute uh, ways of preserving their environment and building infrastructure that incorporates sustainable ideas and technologies and keep it there for a long time. Here we have, with the each ad coming administration, uh, environmental policy, I actually like to call it natural capital because that's what it is, uh, 
comes and goes. There's no cohesive long-term structure. How do you put in place, given that we have, we live in a democracy, um, which is wonderful, but we don't have a cohesive long-term in place like oil subsidies. How can we achieve that? Uh, thanks. Uh, thank you, Chris. So, um, uh, you noted that the Chinese are surging forward, not just on infrastructure, but on pollution, and certainly I witnessed that firsthand. Uh, 14 years ago, when I was in a cloud of smog in Beijing, uh, folks explained that that was from all the family coal-fired uh, home stoves, if you will. Uh, now those are largely gone, and you have a worse smog in Beijing, and in every other major Chinese city, and it's being driven by pollution from cars and from virtually unregulated manufacturing processes uh, across the country. I found it ironic to be going to a solar crystal a PV factory when the product requires direct sunlight, and there wasn't direct sunlight to be found in any urban center in the entire nation. The, uh, the, the fact is that uh, pollution is a major problem in China. Uh, I wouldn't say that they are being highly successful at this point in using, as, as you put it, kind of the dictatorial framework to put in place strong environmental policies uh, because really what they're focused on more, as far as I could tell, is the marketing side. Producing technologies, manufacturing those, and selling them to, to the world and it's kind of an argument that they came back to time and time again of, of saying, once we're wealthy, then we can worry about the environment. Meanwhile, uh, the uh, diplomatic personnel were, were noting that they didn't feel they could stay in the country for more than two years because it was really a moral dilemma to have the health of their family members afflicted for more than two years breathing that smog day in and day out. And one person told me that his doctor had asked why he had taken up smoking after examining his lungs. And another told me about China cough, uh, a syndrome for children who uh, get a regular cough they can't kick like a smoker who's been smoking for 10 or 20 years. And so, um, but when it comes to how we can take policy forward in America, if we run into a dead end, as we did in the argument over using market forces to get the most bang for the buck in reducing carbon pollution. And remember, that was an idea that came out of the Republican side of the conversation about how to reduce acid rain and reduce sulfur, di sulfur dioxide pollution. And uh, Democrats said, well, let's put a limit on every smokestack. And Republicans said, no, there's a much better way. Use, let's use market forces. And we can put an overall cap, have people trade credits back and forth. And you know what? That strategy worked phenomenally well. It reduced sulfur dioxide faster at a cheaper price than anybody could have imagined because it created a, a, a premium upon people being able to put forward ideas and, and get paid for those ideas. The same idea was proposed to put on carbon dioxide. Uh, the Koch brothers launched a national campaign to reverse that market-based incentive into an energy tax as, in terms of framing that was very effective. So if one place we reach a dead end, as we did last year, then we need another avenue because we've got to bring people together across the aisle. And it's that other avenue that I'm here to talk about today on a strategy on electric cars that a leader, a member of the leadership and the Republican party in the U.S. Senate can embrace and partner with me on, a strategy that Olympia Snow, who's up for election next year, can talk about and bring together because it's too important a problem not to find a way that we can work together to solve it. Thank you very much, uh, Senator Merkley. My name is Elsa Porter. I'm a City Club member. Uh, and my question really is an addendum to your declaration of a really a sustainable policy. And that has to do with our assumption that we are going to continue to be a growth-oriented, consumption-oriented economy and society. Uh, and until we change that basic notion that we have to, that, that consumption uh, and uh, growth uh, is not sustainable in the long haul, uh, I think we are still continuing to be in denial. So how, how can we begin to 
uh, to uh, break through this not just national but global denial about uh, how we will survive on this planet. Thank you, Elsa. This was a, a topic of uh, discussion when I was in college, uh, largely uh, due to uh, Schumacher's book, Small is Beautiful, and the, the conversation that uh, the size of what one consumes is not the measure of the quality of, of life, and it needs to be part of the discussion. And We need to wrestle with things that incentivize additional consumption. And so I'm glad you brought that into this conversation. I think it's an important part of the conversation. I also think that as we wrestle with the fact that much of what we're talking about here is a global conversation in which many families have been living very simply, been living in village settings, and they're aspiring to have much of what we have as middle class Americans. And indeed, I was one of the questions I was asking in China, because there's this massive displacement of folks off the land into the city. And so I was trying to get a sense of how much backlash that is, is creating. And uh, from all the feedback I could get, the basic answer was not much. And the, answer, and the story was folks in the rural countryside, young folks, they see coming to the city, dressing in a Western fashion, being able to buy, per, that is purchase a, uh, an apartment, and to purchase a car as the dream. And that dream is substantial enough that in order to tackle this global energy challenge, we have to come up with ways that will provide enough energy to help embrace that dream while doing so in a sustainable fashion. And so both elements are going to have to be at, at work. I guess we have time for one more question. Tom Karwaki, new City Club member. Senator, uh, the issue of energy efficiency is not one that you have really addressed, and are you going to be supporting putting hundreds and maybe thousands of uh, Oregonians and Washingtonians back to work by extending and expanding the residential energy tax credits uh, for things like windows, insulation? I know myself, I had uh, the house insulated, and unfortunately for Northwest Natural Gas, we only use 25% uh, of the, the gas we used before. So it does work, it does save, and uh, it has cost hundreds of jobs with the loss of that uh, tax credit. I sure am. In fact, I'll take you one further. Uh, I put together a, a series of uh, programs that, uh, one of which is Rural Energy Star, another of which is uh, Building Star, a uh, closely related program was Home Star that my colleague Mark Warner is the lead on last, last cycle. All of these involve low-cost lending strategies to do energy-saving renovations. Now, former President Bill Clinton came to our caucus last year and spoke about measures to create jobs, and the very top measure that he talked about, and he went on at length, was low-cost loans for energy-saving renovations. And I kept wanting him to say, and that's why I'm so proud of Senator Merkley producing those, those two bills on that topic. This never happened. But the reason that it produces more jobs is not only can the labor not be exported, but the materials for energy saving renovations are all made here in the United States. The insulation is made here, the doors and windows. Uh, we've got Geldwin down, down in Klamath Falls making an enormous uh, number of these, these products, double paned windows, insulated doors, and so forth. So if the labor's here and the materials or the components are here, then we keep all that within our economy. And that's why it creates more jobs per dollar. And it's an enormous frustration to me that we can't get those bills to the floor of the Senate and get them voted on. But yes, uh, both the residential energy tax credit and these three bills uh, need to be taken forward. And shall I get them close? Uh, well, just thank you all very much for the chance to come back and be, be with you again and uh, together. Uh, let's build a better world. For those of you listening on the radio, that's a standing ovation. 
We've run out of time for further questions today. Please join us again next week when Congressman Kurt Schrader will tackle how we uh, bring down our federal budget deficit.